Um, so yeah, I'm a senior research associate at the University of Bristol and also based in Bristol, North Somerset and South Gloucestershire ICB. So my role as a researcher in residence, it was quite nice hearing people talking about researchers working with the NHS earlier. That's, I mean, that's kind of my job. So I take on projects that are maybe a little bit more in depth than what other people in the team might normally do. So they take a little bit longer and have are of interest to both the ICB and the research community. And this is one of those projects I'm going to present. So it's a model to form car, forecast long-term emergency department demand. Okay, so the motivation behind this project, um, it was kind of, it came from a conversation of, you know, can we do something better? So what's currently done at the ICB when they need to forecast future ED attendances is they break past attendances down into age bands and forecast, you know, fit a linear regression to what happened in the past to predict the future, aggregate up at site level and that gives you an idea of what might happen over the next year, over the next two years, which is important for budget allocation, service planning, etc. And that, that seems to do quite well, so there's not a problem with it, but it's assuming that the only real driver of ED attendance is, is population, population growth. But what about, for example, if I tried to call 111 and couldn't get through, and I was really worried, would I take myself to the ED? Or quite topically, if you called the ambulance service and couldn't get through, would you take yourself to the ED? So it's quite possible that the, kind of, the capacity of other healthcare services impact how many people attend the ED department. And then also on the other side of things, um, if you have two equivalent populations, so same number of people, but say, in one population, only 2% has had a flu, vac flu vaccine. In the other population, 20% had. Would you expect the same number of ED attendances from those two populations? Possibly not. So it's, like, it's possible that uh, the capacity of other healthcare services and population health might impact ED attendances along with population growth. And so this project was to was I on the right side? <laughs> no, okay, sorry. Um, and so our approach was to try and model future ED attendances incorporating these sorts of variables, so population health and service capacity. Um, a slight challenge which I'll get on to is that population health obviously varies at a much uh, very different rate to service capacity, and if you try to you know, come up with an interve intervention to change or improve population health, then that would happen over a much, much longer time scale than any change in service capacity. Cool. Okay, so the data, all the data was publicly available. I quite enjoyed, there was a talk yesterday um, about using publicly available data and the kind of minefield of downloading it and processing it and combining it into an aggregate data set, which I went through. Um, so yeah, data is publicly available. I used data from 2018 and 2019 because of COVID. So unfortunately, uh, or unless you're you know, answering a research question around COVID, then the COVID period in terms of the data, when you're talking about, when you're thinking about health services, it's not actually very useful because it's not typical of what would happen outside of a pandemic. So yeah, data from 2018 and 2019, because that was what was available at the time. Uh, so the capacity variables that I used are the number of 111 calls offered, and that came from the NHS 111 minimum, minimum data set. Uh, the number of ambulance calls answers, that came from AMSIS. The number of GP appointments available, which came from in general practice. Um, the population health variables, they came from the ONS's health index, which is quite new and it's meant to be a, <clears throat> um, it's kind of updated from IMD or index of multiple deprivation, so they're trying to take it forward rather than using IMD. Um, it can be broken down into three components, so there's people, which is health outcomes, and that's things like 
um, life expectancy, mortality, suicide rates, places which are wide determinants of health, so that's access to green space, distance to your GP or to your A&E department, and lives which are health related behaviours and personal circumstances, so um, pre smoking prevalence, vaccination uptake, um, yeah, the prevalence for obesity. And I also include a population in the model because that's what's been included so far in the past. And obviously my dependent variable is ED attendances, ED attendances per month. That's what I'm trying to forecast. Um, as a little small caveat, I started this at the start of the year when CCG still existed. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to refer to monthly ED attendances per CCG. Obviously CCGs now don't exist, but it's more CCGs are a geographical region and this model can easily be used for ICSs once the data is available. Cool. Um, a slight aside on capacity versus utility. So you might think that or it's fairly, fairly easy to justify that the capacity of other health services could impact ED demand or ED attendances but so could the utility. So if I increase the number of ambulances available by 50%, if, oh, okay, bad, bad example. Um, if I increase the number of one on one calls available by 100%, if the number of one on one calls also increased, then that's not gonna have any difference. And so there's, you know, these variables are highly correlated, as you can see from the plots and I originally intended to incorporate both measures of service capacity and measures of service utility, but because they're highly correlated, um, it masks, if you have highly correlated variables and model, it masks the effects of the other one. So I kept the capacity variables in, scrapped the utility, mainly because GP utility wasn't in the publicly available data wasn't recorded for the second half of 2018, so I had a lot of missing data. So keep the capacity, but they are highly correlated. Just one other thing to point out on this plot you might have noticed is that the ambulance service is always running at capacity. Um, so yeah, capacity is always lower than utility, or capacity is always lower than demand for the ambulance service, which I'll come to again in, in a few slides. Cool. Okay, so can state models, it's a regression problem. Uh, I want to know the number of attendances per month. Obvious choices, so uh, a linear regression, that's, what been, that's what's been done previously, and variants, so things like Lasso and Lars. A multi-level regression, so because the data, so the, the data set I created has one row per CCG per month, per year. So there's one row that are this is you know, the, all the variables for BNSSG in February 2018, etc. So there's obviously groupings in the data because there's years and there's CCGs. So a multi-level regression might make sense. Um, random forest plus variance. Why random forest? Because it can deal with non-linear relationships. There's no guarantee that any of these variables are linear, linearly related to easy attendances. I've put a star there saying capacity only. That is because, because of the way I, we constructed the data set. The population health variables only vary annually. So if each row is a single month, then you have, for one CCG in one year, 12 rows or 12 data points have the same value of the population health variables. And that means, so all the models I fit using um, five-fold cross-validation, and when you split the data into the training and test sets, if you have variables that are constants across groups of data points, then you find that your model actually performs very well. You can suddenly explain or predict the number of media attendances per month with like 99% accuracy. Okay, and how do these models perform? So the linear regression, did best, uh, R squared or variance explained of 0.53. Multi-level regression didn't do well at all, and the random forest 
So when I say plus variant, variants, that includes um, extra trees, gradient booster trees, other boosts, little ensembles of decision trees. Um, but it was actually the standard random forest that performed best with an R squared of 0.41. So from the coefficients of the linear regression, it looked like the measures of service capacity were more predictive of ED attendances than measures of population health, including population, which seems a bit strange. So the researcher in me wanted to understand what was going on. So I looked at the mutual information between each of my independent variables and ED attendances. So the mutual information tells you how much knowing the value of one of these independent variables tells you about the value of your dependent variable. And it can deal with non-linear relationships. That's the difference. Um, and what mutual information told me was actually the population health variables are far more important than capacity variables. So it suggests maybe we want a non-linear type framework. Obviously I've said that we can't because of the fact that the variables kind of change at different rates, so population health changes annually, service capacity changes monthly, we can't put them all into a random forest together, so why not have separate models? So I spent a while thinking about this. This is my kind of non-linear machine learning version of a multi-level regression. We have a capacity model, which obviously takes in measures of service capacity, and that predicts the monthly ED attendances for each CCG. And then the population health model takes population and measures of population health in as independent variables, and it predicts the mean monthly ED attendances per year, per CCG. And then these are very imaginatively named. Uh, the combined model combines the output of both. So it's just, it's a, just a linear regression. And um, essentially you can think of it as capacity model, the predictions from the capacity model are being kind of improved by this expected mean number of ED attendances over the course of the year. Okay, and a quick aside on a random forest. Um, random forests are made of decision trees. You can think of a decision tree like a flow chart. Um, and each tree in the forest is trained on a random subset of the data which say so they're far less likely to overfit your data than a single decision tree. And if you put, a, say you put a data point through a decision tree, it would come up with a prediction for the number of easy attendances. Each tree in the forest would give you a slightly different prediction. And then the random forest itself, the final <coughs> prediction of the number of ED attendances per month is just the average of the predictions from each tree in the forest. And sorry, there's like, uh, the classes on the image, uh, that's obviously a classification for us, but mine was regression. Cool. And then to evaluate the model, so for each component model, I looked at the R squared, the variance explained, and re used repeated fivefold cross validation. Um, and also for the overall model, again, assessed it with the variance explained. Obviously, I want the point of the model is not, it's not just a regression, it's for forecasting, so to assess the forecasting accuracy, I use the mean absolute percentage error, training on 2019, and forecast, sorry, training on 2018, forecasting 2019. And then for the feature importance, so for the component models, the population health and the combined model, I was, you can use the built-in features, feature importance from scikit-learn, I should say that all of this is done in scikit-learn, Cyclin is great, um, but because the MGSR is a kind of bespoke uh, ensemble, there's no built-in feature importance, so I use the permutation importance, so that's you randomly shuffle each feature while keeping all the other ones fixed, and the drop in model performance after the feature's been shuffled is a measure of how important that feature is. And the results. So I've already said on a previous slide that the capacity model around the forest fitted to capacity variables uh, could explain 41% of the variance in monthly ED attendances. The population health model can explain 61% of the variance in mean monthly ED attendances. And combined, I get an R squared of 0.75. So 
that NGS R and Falcon explain 75% of variance in monthly ED, ED attendances per CCG. Okay. Um, there's also some outliers in this plot. And when I look closely at the data, they're Liverpool and Hull, kind of wanting to understand what was going on, why they're outliers. So it turns out these CCGs have particularly low values of people and lives, which are the components of the health index, or not necessarily, they're not low compared to all other CCD, CCGs, but the relationship between their values of people and lives and the true number of ED attendances a month, which is the x-axis in these plots, um, is different to other CCGs with low values of these variables. Um, also just as an aside, something interesting to note from these plots is the population one on the bottom right. You see that, so I've scaled, oh, I should have said this earlier, I scaled the population and the capacity variables by population. So everything's in units of 10,000 people. And so I was actually predicting the number of ED attendances per 10,000 people for each CCG. And you see that that the CCGs with smaller populations, so they're the darker red spots on, this, on the bottom right plot, they actually have more ED attendances, which I find quite interesting. <laughs> um, cool. Uh, so forecasting performance, I trained on 2018, predicted on 2019. The mean absolute percentage error is 4%, which I was quite pleased with. Um, Feature importance, this is permutation feature importance. Shuffling each feature and looking at the reduction in R squared for the whole model. Um, you know, population is the most important, followed by lives, which are um, risk factors such as levels of smoking, alcohol misuse, and then amb ambulance capacity. Cool. And then finally, did a little bit of scenario modeling. So what what might happen in the future, or over the next four years, if we increased capacity of services. So that's an instant increase. So say, next month, uh, ambulance capacity is increased by 10% everywhere, and that's sustained over the four year period. Or we improved population health in regions where it was below average in 2019. And that's an incremental change. So month on month, it's improved so year on year, it's improved slightly until it reaches the kind of 2019 average. Population growth is do nothing. So all of the other scenarios also include population growth. And we find that increasing the capacity of other services largely uh, doesn't do anything except for the uh, increasing ambulance capacity leads to an increase in ED attendances. And that is because from the data, the ambulance service is always operating at capacity. Um, so that's what, I mean, that's what this forecast tells us. Because it's not in the data, the model can't tell us what would happen if the ambulance service wasn't operating at capacity. And they were actually, yeah. Cool. Um, and then, so obviously also from the plot, the lower line where ED attendances actually decrease over four years that's improving population health, and that's probably quite an obvious result, maybe, to people here, that actually if we had healthier people, we wouldn't have so many emergencies, people needing emergency care, um, a very rough bit of maths, and it's a rough calculation that doesn't include or factor in the cost of improving population health. Um, but yeah, this could obviously save quite a lot of money over four years. Cool, and then just to wrap up, so, yeah, I've presented, I've applied this model to ED demand, but the architecture for combining data that varies at different temporal frequencies uh, it could be used in lots of other places. I've currently got a master's student applying it to some other publicly available health data. A healthy population means fewer ED, ED attendances, it's obvious. Um, I'm currently working on applying this model locally, so it's obviously useful to see what might happen globally across CCGs, but I mean, where it could really be used is within the ICS to understand what they might want to do in the future. 
And I think I'm out of time, so I'm going to stop talking. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of open source, open science, so all of the code and the data is available on GitHub. I've also, I'm an academic, so I wrote a paper, so if you scan the QR code, you get to see my paper, um, you don't have to read it. Cool, thank you.